Hi, I'm Selena from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester, and I'm here with Jane Yolen, who is an author. And Jane, I'm going to let you tell people what it is you write. I write a little bit of everything. I write poetry. That was my first love. I write nonfiction. I tried to be a... Um, I, I tried to be a journalist. It turned out that I was too much of a liar to be a journalist. So I had to give that career up. Um, I have written over the years, let's see, nonfiction, fiction, poetry, um, uh, um, 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 movies, small movies, not big ones. Um, uh, I'm writing librettos for operas. I write um, picture books, a lot of picture books for children. Um, I write middle grade fiction and teenage fiction. I've done verse novels. I've done graphic novels. Um, what am I leaving out? I don't know. I'm working with a friend right now on a TV show. Um, and I have three librettos on the boil. Oh, yes. And at 80, I joined a band and wrote all the lyrics for the band. What haven't you written? Well, you know, <laughs> like all bands, uh, it broke up after a year. <laughs> I've been, now I can say my my son, Adam Stemple, is in a band and in many bands. And I have been in a band. That is unbelievable. Wow. <laughs> so, okay. So what can readers expect from your latest endeavor? And what is your latest endeavor? My latest endeavor has not been um, taken for publication yet, but it's a first novel called The Poacher's Girl. I'm very fond of it. That doesn't mean it's going to be taken. I've learned over a very long career. I mean, I'm 84 now, and my first book was taken when I was 22, but I had had poetry published before then. And over a long career, you know, you know that you're not gonna sell everything. Um, but sometimes you're surprised because 10 years later or 20 years later, somebody takes it. Um, that's because publishing changes and shifts. Uh, the editor who buys it may not have been born yet. Um, so, and since I have so many children and grandchildren who are also published writers, I am assuming that when I die, they will go and take my old stuff and rewrite it, <laughs> which is fine. So okay. the, the new one is called The Poacher's Girl, um, a, a verse novel, and it's based on Sleeping Beauty, uh, but, but, uh, I just enjoy the writing. And and uh, it's it's the writing that keeps me going every day. I actually write a poem a day and send it to about um, yes. nine nine hundred to a thousand subscribers. Wow, that is it, it's amazing how much you write. Uh, you've written <laughs> over over four hundred books. I know that well, that have I, been published. Published. 400 books. I yes. have about 100 not sold. Manuscripts not sold. So, wow. so who knows what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. so, I, might, I might hit 500 when I'm alive. I might hit 500 when I'm dead. I'd rather it happen when I was alive. <laughs> I'd like <laughs> to know. <laughs> yeah. So when, when you write, um, you are you a um, a pantser or a uh, an outliner? I am a pantser, but I like to call it flying into the mist. Aha! Uh -huh. Okay. Pantser, pantser sort of sounds like yeah, she's that kind of person, and I don't want <laughs> to be categorized that way. Um, okay. Interesting. When um when when I listened to the the recent um, interview you did with my son, Adam, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that he is now self-identifying as a sort of partial pantser. He's always been the plotter in our family. He, mm. I would watch him sit down uh, and when we would write together, he would come up with plots 
but I would come up with the dialogue and the movement and that sort of thing. And, and um, I'm terrible at plot. It, if I try to sit and plot something, I can't do it. But if I'm going along and I go, oh, really? That's where it's going. Let me follow it and see what happens. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that keeps me writing because I'm like the little kid who wants to know what happens next. Mm -hmm. And the only way I'm going to find out is by writing it. Mm -hmm. That's the fun part of it. Absolutely. That's really fun to do that. Yeah. So what was the inspiration for your latest latest published book? And um, I know you've had a couple of published books mm. recently. Let me think what was recently published. I um, I think it was this Scarlet Circus. Scarlet, was published recently. Scarlet Circus is actually a collection of stories that were already written. Right. Um, okay. Part of a whole, uh, 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 there's the Emerald Circus and the Midnight Circus, and then one book that was called um, uh, How to Fracture a Fairy Tale, and then this one, which is the Scarlet Circus, which the, and each of them uh, um, intimates what uh, the the title intimates what's in it because the Midnight Circus are horror stories. Um, if you would ask me, did I did I write horror? I probably would have said no. But mm -hmm. then when I went back and looked at some of my old um, uh, short stories. I have lots and lots and lots of short stories that have been published. Um, uh, I found a number of horror stories. And then I remembered, yes, I had won a horror award once. <laughs> and I had been been um, in a couple of horror anthologies. But I don't think of myself as that way. I think of Adam as being the horror writer in our family. I mm -hmm. am the fairy tale person mm -hmm. in my family. Heidi is the one who writes most of the um, um, stuff about uh, uh, birds and horses and bears and whatever. You know, she's 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 the nature girl. Uh, and my son Jason writes uh, writes uh, about nature when he has to write about it. Mostly, he's a nature photographer, and he's he's a fairly well known nature photographer and. And he also works for for um, three different TV nature shows about fishing. So his his work is seen there, but you won't. But he doesn't write as much as the rest of us do. And then Adam's daughter um, um, has uh, about to publish her first picture book she wrote with me. And Heidi's daughter, who is just about to get her law degree. Uh, is uh, has two picture books out with me, both of them are ideas we worked on together. Uh, so, so, but writing I'm the, family, yeah, I'm the real fairy tale person. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, so all of these the, the, um, stories in the Scarlet Circus are they're love stories of a sort, but they're all using characters from from folklore or, uh, you know, so you have a, a ghost story, but it's, it's you have a, you have a tra uh, traveling in time story. Um, uh, there's a, a djinn um, who a, a, a Greek slave finds in a bottle and they end up being, being a, a, a couple for eternity uh, at the end. So, the, so every, all of the stories that are in there are love stories, but they are. One is about one is about a princess, and one is about a, a unicorn, and that sort of thing. So they all, all have have um, uh, fantasy elements in them. And then in the back of each of the the books, I have for each story how and when I wrote it, and a poem to go with it. So you get a little bit of everything that I do in those books. Mm hmm. And then you also have another uh, dinosaur book out. Uh, the latest yeah. dinosaur book. The latest dinosaur book is, I think, uh, kindness. Kindness. But kindness, the next yeah. coming out is going to be um, uh, trick or treat. Uh -huh. So there are about twenty four, twenty five of those out now. And right, I've sold twenty four million copies of my dinosaur books all around the world. Wow. 
So what was the inspiration, actually, for the Dinosaur series? Um, one of my editors at Scholastic called me up and she said, we were friends. We'd been friends for a number of years over several different publishers. And uh, she was the one um, who called me up um, when I was in Scotland. Uh, and she said, you know, my little boy, Robbie, um, he's, he's three years old. He hates going to bed and he loves dinosaurs. Is there anything you can do for him? So I wrote him a little poem which I sent to her over, um, this was before email, so it was, you, be, you were able to send it through a machine. I forget what, it, I, I don't even remember what the machine is called. They're long gone. Um, Alex? Something like that, but not. Yeah. Um, and, and she, um, and I said, here's a little poem for Robbie. And it was called, How Does a Dinosaur Say Goodnight? And she called me up again and she said, Robbie loves the poem. And he's sleeping now, but that's a book and I'm going to publish it. So that's how the first book got published. It took me probably 20 minutes to write. And, and because it was a poem, a little, little rhymed poem, you know, how does a dinosaur say goodnight when mommy comes in to turn off the light? If, if you've been writing crime poems all your life, that wasn't, a, that wasn't a reach, but it became the whole series became kind of, I don't know, spectacular. And uh, mostly, I think, because the pictures are so wonderful. I didn't do the pictures. I can't draw. But Mark Teague went right. from zero to a thousand with these these uh, pictures. I, I mean, his stuff is, and, and he was the one who put in all the interracial families in them. I didn't because I wasn't talking about the colors of the, the dinosaurs or the kids. And he said, how do you feel about this? And I said, what a terrific idea. Go, go for it. So, so in a sense, I mean, I may have written the poem, but between the editor and the illustrator, those books have just gone on and on and on. Wow. That's, that's wonderful. Now, there's one thing um, I had gone to a uh, the, the uh, Society for Children's Book Writers and Illustrators seminar that you gave, and you had said one thing um, about getting ideas for stories that really, really hit me. And you said there's a story in everything. Yeah, I don't understand people who say I don't have any ideas. You walk down the street. You go, I have, I live on a, on a, on an old farm. We don't farm it anymore. It's just there right now. It's full of, you know, like bears and, and, and coyotes <laughs> and deer and you name it. Um, but if you walk outside, if you pick up a newspaper, if you read someone else's book, if you watch a TV show, if you look at your children playing, um, if you talk to your father, your grandfather about what they did when they were kids or what they did in the war or what they, there's stories lurking in all those corners. And if you're a writer and if you're a passionate writer, you go and you sneak and steal those stories and you make them your own. I used to take, when, when, when Heidi and I, um, my daughter Heidi and I had something called uh, picture book boot camp um, where we had, I think it was probably about, 10 or 12 people at a time would come to stay at the house, my house, um, and for um, a long weekend. And we would teach. And now Heidi does a lot of that teaching at Highlights. Um, and I do some occasionally. But we would take people, I would take people out on a, on a walk around the farm. And I say, if you don't come back from this walk with 10 ideas, you're not trying. You're not working hard. I said, look, the, and I, I would show them, I would say, look, there's a, there's an acorn on top of this stump. Who, who put it there? Did they put it there to entice something or someone? Uh, did they lose it? Uh, is there a squirrel around going around? Where's my acorn? Where's my acorn? Uh, it, that's the start of a story. Um, look, there's a hole there. What lives in that hole? Um, oh, look. 
this dirt has been turned over. Well, who turned that dirt over? I mean, there's a story in all of those things. And I said, if you come back and you have 10 stories, then you start your work. Finding the stories is the easy part. When you when you when you've got you go back and you look and you do what really is triage, um, which is what they used to do in in old war um, uh, days when the doctors would go and look at oh this one this this, this person is we we're going to be able to save this one he's salvageable this one will work hard and this one's DOA so you work first on the ones you can save right. Um, and that's what you do with 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 these story ideas that you come back. This one, this one is workable. Put that one aside. This one's almost there. Put that one aside. This one needs a lot of um, you know pushing on the heart before we get we get it working again. And that one's DOA. And that's so you so you know when you come back. You have work to do just to see who can be resuscitated and what can be made into a story. The thing is that sometimes the DOA story you keep because years later you know what to do with it. And like the revenant, it rises up from the grave. And I have a lot of stories that rose up from the grave. The poacher's girl is one of them. I had the idea for the story. I even wrote some of the poems for the story. Then I put it aside because I didn't know where it was going. Um, hmm. and it showed me it finally showed me where it was going but it was about 20 years later mm -hmm. so uh, you can find inspiration for many things that's that's what absolutely. I wanted to do absolutely absolutely yeah okay the funny, thing, the funny thing is you could see the same things and not see those stories and I could see some stories over here that you don't see and you could see stories over there that I don't see because you're bringing to the stories who you are already and what you know and what you love. Um, and the story of Sleeping Beauty is one I've told over and over and over and over again in various different ways. Um, so, so, so when teaching people how to write, you can teach them some things, but you have to leave them open to other things that, that I can't teach them because they have to find it. They have to find right. it themselves. Right. So um, when you're writing your books, um, especially your, your your latest books, do you do a lot of research? Well, it depends. Okay. Well, let me tell you the two or three books that I've written recently. One, The Poacher's Girl didn't need any research. I already know the story of, of Sleeping Beauty. Um, I, I, you know, you, you, you don't, you don't have to make up the, 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 uh, the hedge. And if you, if you use your imagination, you can imagine what happens to somebody who's caught in the hedge ends up being just bones in the hedge. Um, so there's nothing there for me to research. Heidi and I have been doing a series of, of, of rhymed picture books. The first one was called Eek. You reek, and it's about animals that stink, stank, and stunk. Mm -hmm. yeah, we had to do research, a lot of research, because also after their in their poems, um, but in the back, there's a whole section on more information about each of the animals, and uh, and and what, where, and what, and how they use the stink. We've just just had one published last year that was a sequel to that called Yuck, You Suck. And it's animals that suck. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you right now, the vampire bat does not suck. We think of it as the animal, the first one we thought of, we'll do this book and we'll do the vampire bat. And I said, I'm gonna do the poem. And when I did the research, I found out that they don't suck. They lip and laugh with their tongue but they do not suck. <laughs> and little boys love that book and they love that poem. We just, we, Heidi and I did a, a big thing for one of the um, uh, Boston area bookstores. Uh, and and uh, I said that to, to begin it, I said, how many of you have heard of the vampire bat? 
they all they all raised their hands. And I said, I can tell you without fear of contradiction that the vampire bat does not suck. And just everybody was, you know, giggling, giggling away. And the mothers and fathers are going. And then I explained, you know, this. these are uh, these other animals all either they they suck their food, they suck for locomotion, um, but the vampire bat makes a little incision with its teeth and then it laps up. It doesn't suck, it just laps up the blood. Hmm. Interesting. So, so so there you have a book of funny poems, and you learn something, you learn something that's actual in each mm -hmm. of the the, the uh, things. Wow. So what was your favorite research story? My favorite research story. Oh, I can tell you the stories that 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 uh, bothered me the most to begin okay. with. Um, I've written three Holocaust novels. Oh, yeah. The research for those, even though each of them was very different, set in a different place. Um, one was in Poland. One was in the Warsaw Ghetto, basically, though it didn't call it the Warsaw Ghetto, but it was. Um, uh, and and um, they were hard because of the stories that you had to read. Um, the doing the doing the research for the Yakusak and Ikurik, and I'm dying to do fool you drool, but we haven't sold it yet. Um, uh, it is the difference between night and day. One is you're looking at animals first of all, the other is you're looking at, at people in in terrible distress. Um, but. But those, I think, are the two that that that's sort of the yin and yang of of the research that I've done. I've done um, other books that you know, that are research bound, um, and a lot of books that are just uh, made up stories or made up of of um, sort of fractured fairy tales. Okay. Fairy tales, are, fairy tales are a very interesting thing because sometimes they're they're so in um, part of our core. Do you think you know the story and you know what it means and you've you've heard it so many times and in so many various different slight variations, but there are ones that we that we think and we love that we don't really parse. I got this is this is my favorite one. Um, we we um, know um, uh, Snow White. We love the dwarfs. Um, it's a wonderful story of of um, retribution and and uh, you know, but if you think about it, here's a prince who comes, sees the beautiful young dead woman in the casket, the, the glass casket, and in the original story, he pays the he pays the dwarfs to let him buy the girl in the glass casket. No one ever asks what he wants with a dead girl in a casket, no matter how beautiful she is. Um, does he want it? Want her to put on his coffee table on display? Does he want to make her a museum piece? Does he want her for dinner? <laughs> does, is he a necrophile? Yeah, we, we never go there when no. we read that story. And yet, there it is. It's not even buried. It's right in your face. And then his men lift up the casket, and one man trips, and the casket tumbles a bit, and out pops the piece of poison apple, and she sits up. Now, here's the other thing we never say. What does the prince think now? He bought a dead girl in a casket and she's not dead. She's alive. She's going to talk to him. She's going to yell at him. She's going to speak to him. Uh, she may run away. What the does he want with a dead girl in a casket who is now a live girl? Does he ask for his money back? <laughs> I mean, to me, that's, I love looking at, fairy tales from another direction 
and asking the questions that we don't ask. That is so interesting. <laughs> you never would think about that. No, you no. just automatically take it at face value. <laughs> Exactly. And it's romantic at face value. And it is not very romantic when you start looking at it from a no, different it isn't. Well, Yeah. Very true. Wow. So what was the biggest challenge um, that you had in in um writing and putting out um let's say your first book? My first book um was <laughs> a nonfiction book about lady okay. pirates. You didn't know there were light, lot, a lot of lady pirates, did you? No. You have, and Bonnie and Mary Reed. You might have heard about Madame Ching because she's actually in the big parlay scene in <sighs> in the um, uh, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Okay. Um, and and when I saw it, I went, "Yes, there's Madame Ching," because she was actually the greatest pirate the world has ever known. She had something like 5,000 ships and 50,000 men under her command. I mean, they ruled the China Seas. And they finally stopped um, when the um, the Empress of China came to, to Madam Ching and said, if you will retire, I will make you an admiral in my Navy. And you will have, wow. you, you will never have to worry about money or looking for money again. And so she did. But but um, so but that happened because I had tried to do some some um, uh, books for children. What happened was I had um, I had just started a job in publishing, which I did. I held jobs as assistant editor and associate editor for. Um, the first five years out of after college, and um, I wanted to write. Uh, I had found out that I was not good as as a journalist because I made up things. Of course, now I understand they all make up things, but mm -hmm. I that that was that was um, a disgusting thing to do as a journalist, and I did not like making up things when I did make up things. So um, I decided I couldn't be a journalist. Um, but I still wanted to write. And I got a letter in the mail from um, an editor who said she was um, going around to schools, colleges, and universities. She was a traveler. They called him a traveler, I think, for, for a random house knopf. Um, and she was asking the various people at the colleges, uh, who were the best writers who had graduated recently and the ones that they thought might have actual manuscripts. And when she went to Smith College, which was my college, she asked, um, and the only name they gave was mine. And uh, now that's a little bit, I was president of the press club at Smith College, writing writing stuff about the college that went out to all the all the newspapers. And um the head of that was a woman who had been um a World War II correspondent. I mean she was Dudley Dudley Harmon. She was a tremendously wonderful person. And she and I became friends. And instead of going to the English department, this woman, this uh, editor, what had been sent to Dudley to ask about who was the best person. And the only name she gave was mine. So I got this letter from um, Judith. I can't remember his, her last name now, but she was. She became. Um, uh, she became the editor for Julia Child. Um, and and she um, said, "Did I have anything that I'm working on that she could look at?" And I said, "Oh, many things." She said, "Well, um, would you um, come in and and visit me in two weeks?" I said, "Yes, I will." So I had two weeks to write <laughs> something. I thought children's books—they're short. I'll write a I'll write some children's books. So I wrote a bunch of children's books, which were terrible. 
I knew nothing about children's books except what I had read when I was a child. And uh, I went to see her and she was really sweet. She looked at what I had and included was a one page thing on, on Lady Pirates because I had loved pirates since I was a child and I had discovered Lady Pirates in like fifth grade. Uh, and uh, she said, oh, these, these are interesting, but not publishable. But she took me down to talk to the uh, Knopf um, children's book editor, and she explained to me why they weren't publishable. And she was absolutely right. Um, so there I was, my big time lost, of course. Um, but my father was um, president of the Overseas Press Club at the time. And he started sending me to various places. And one of the places he sent me to, he always only knew the top person. So he would send me to the top person of this or that and the other. Um, and then they would always sort of fob me off. But one um, at one place took me down to the to the children's book person. And she bought um, she bought uh, the, the pirate book. She first said, well, you know, I never buy anything from people who are not published. And I said, well, I've published a lot of nonfiction pieces over the years when I was at Smith. Um, and I published, uh, um, you know, yada, yada. Uh, and I worked as a newspaper person and I worked at Newsweek one summer, um, but that was mostly research. And so she said, well, I'll tell you what, I will buy this book and I'll give you a contract for it, but I won't pay you anything until you, in a year, you bring me back the finished product. And I said, I can't believe I did this. I said, if you give me a little bit of money, I would be honor bound to finish it. Ignoring the whole fact that I would have signed the contract. Um, and, and she said, all right, I'll give you two, $250. And in a year, you'll bring it back to me. And of course, I brought it back to her much earlier than a year. And she and she published it. And that was my first book, Pirates in Petticoats. They didn't wear petticoats, but Pirates in Petticoats. Wow. And it was True. nonfiction. I did a lot of research. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and from there on, I just then, I took a course in writing for children at the new school and went on from there. Oh, okay. So what's your favorite part about being a writer on the whole writing and publishing process? Finishing a book. <laughs> no, yep. I love starting the book and I love finishing it. It's a hard slog in, in the middle and you just have to st stick to it. Um, I tell every one of my students, but in chair, is that's 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 what if if you're not able to sit in a chair and um, write hour after hour after hour after hour, you're never going to have anything good enough to, because it's not the writing, it's the rewriting that mm -hmm. makes the story. Um, uh, you have to have ideas, but ideas, every single idea that I have gotten, I could have twisted in 17 different ways at least. And so it's the choosing what you're going to do with the idea and then going ahead, but in chair. I also get get dressed up in the morning because I'm going to work. Uh, I don't I don't write in my jammies. Mm -hmm. If I'm in my jammies, I just say, oh yeah, it's time to bed. Uh, or or I wander around, it's time for breakfast. You know, I I need to be ready to write. And ready to write for me means dressed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so what else can we expect from you in the near future? Um, gosh, I've got about 35 books that are sold. So they're coming out. Some of them are picture books, so they need to be illustrated. So it'll take a little while. I have a book. I've just seen the stunningly beautiful pictures for a picture book called... Um, 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 wait a minute, I'll get it, uh, Tea with an Old Giant. And it's about a giant who comes into an old sort of horse horse town 
um, uh, Western town. And everybody runs away except for this little girl who looks up at him. He's a huge giant. I mean, and uh, and basically they play checkers and 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 have mud tea. And at the end, he says she she gives her one of his dolls, her dolls, to keep him company because he's so lonely. And then um, she he says, and when I come back, I'll come back with another kind of checkers. And I'll make tea this time because <laughs> she made mud tea, you know, like kids do. Um, and it's a very sweet, sweet little story about a friendship between an old, very old giant and a very young girl who's not mm -hmm. afraid of him because he's just an interesting person. And she does not know any of the awful things that a giant is supposed to do to you. And um, uh it's coming out, and uh, that's coming out from Raycraft. And I have, I've seen the, also the pictures for another picture book, but it's a picture book, poetry book that I wrote with one of my students called Body Music. And it's about all the sounds your body makes, you know, whether it's coughs, grunts, clicking fingers, um, farts, but in poems. Hmm. And so that's coming out. And what else is coming out um, that I've seen? Oh, um, I retold the um, Helm, some of the Helm stories, but as a as a, um, a short novel called um, Schlemiel Comes to America, and I've seen the pictures for that too. And he comes to America, but he but he brings along all of all of the. Um, the stories and uses them to make his way in America. And at the end he goes, America, America, I love America. <laughs> um, and let's see, what else do I have coming out? Um, I have an immigration book coming out um, that I, that I found, I, I tell my, my grand, my father's parents who came from the Ukraine, um, a story, um, and that I found an Iranian poet uh, telling her story how she got her family got out of Iran, and she's now living in Scotland. And a young Hispanic woman who uh, came on a terrible journey with her family, and her father, her father finally was able to to uh, come and find them, but but the older sister could not come. Um, and she's still there and still menaced by by the fierce gangs. So so it's the story, and they're very each of the stories, though they're very different, uh, are um, also uh, very similar. So that was wow. fun. That was fun. So you've got so many things going on. It's amazing. I know. So, I know. Yeah. So what do you consider the most challenging part of the writing process? And of the whole, you know, and how do you overcome that? Uh, I used to, when something got turned down, you know, as everybody often does, you want to kick, the, you know, you want to kick the table, go kick the cat. You want to send a nasty letter back. So, And then I realized it's an invitation to move on. All right, that editor didn't like it. Wrong editor. Find the editor who wants it. I mean, I... I have resold or sold stuff that's 20 years old. Um, and, and I know it's because one, as I said, the editor who's going to buy that book hasn't been born yet. Some of the editors who have bought my books are that much younger than me that they would not have literally been born when I wrote that first time through. A lot of times I find something that I can rewrite because I'm a better writer, because times have changed, um, because um, I know more editors. Uh, my name is good enough that somebody who has a smaller publishing company might want something from me. Uh, all those things are in that mix. Um, I'm also, I'm also one of the older, the oldest writing writers, certainly for children's books around these days, because most of all my peers have died. 
Um, and and uh, so uh, in some ways, that makes me more interesting to an editor. In some ways, it makes me less interesting because they think, oh, she's not connected. She doesn't know. She won't be able to go on all these book tours, et cetera, et cetera. Um, she doesn't come from um, um, an underdeveloped or under um, underused uh, uh, background. She's um, uh, she's told so many stories, she must be rewriting the same stories over and over and over again. I mean, there are many reasons not to take, you know, not to buy me. And there are many reasons to buy me. But it's a question of finding the right person. And mm -hmm. the only thing is, I'm getting sometimes letters saying, oh, this is lyrically and beautifully written. And oh, what a wonderful story you've told here, but we're going to pass. And I'm thinking, really? You want me to t write really badly and not lyrically and tell a stupid story? Got it. I don't think so. You know, so so editors should be a little more wary about <laughs> how they how they're voicing their turn down. I'm not I'm not troubled by being turned down, but I have to sort of bite my tongue when I read some of the reasons why they say they're turning it down. And I'm going, I was an editor for a long time. I was five years with Knopf. I was nine years with an imprint of my own at uh, Harcourt Brace. I know how to edit. I know how to say this is not for us because this is when I, when I was editing my imprint at, um, at uh, um, Harcourt, I was doing a fantasy and science fiction imprint. And I would get people sending me cookbooks and uh, adult books and um, nonfiction books and mysteries and um, uh, joke books. Because then they just heard there was a new, uh, a new editor looking for new yeah. stuff, but they didn't read further. Yeah. So when I send stuff out, I try to make it, I'm sending it to someone who might possibly, and I have an agent, you know, we talk about it, who might possibly be interested in this. If I read in Publishers Weekly that so-and-so um, is looking for the best cat book in the world, you know, or is looking for um, stories about young explorers or stories about X, Y, or Z, I pay attention to that. Do I already have that story? Is it already in my backlog? Sometimes it is. Okay. So what has been your greatest adventure during your writing career? My greatest adventure. This is not an adventure, but it's a funny story. Will that work? I guess so. Sure. All right. Bruce Coville, who is a children's book writer and a fantasy yep. writer, um, uh, and one of my best friends, was staying over at my house because we were writing a novel together, uh, which got published. And um, and But we had been working for 14 hours, and we figured we better walk, go outside and walk. So we took a walk around the block, which is a two-mile walk. Um, and as we're on, heading on the way back to my house, uh, there's a man painting the front of his house. Now, the front of his house was also, had been the old Lutheran church. Uh, and, and the Lutherans, for whatever reason, left our little town. And um, I had always wanted, but I didn't know him. I had no way of meeting this guy. I wanted to find out what it's like living in an old, you know, in, in an, in an old um a church and and um there he was and so um i said bruce hold on a second and and i went over to him and i said hi uh, my name is jane yolen and i live here in in hatfield half for the last 40 years whatever it was i said i'm curious um about what it's like living in in a church and what made you buy it and he came down the ladder and he said well let me show you around and he took us in, and the inside of the church was still looked just like a church with a bunch of pews piled up on one another. Um, 
And um, they were living downstairs in what would have been the big kitchen where people would have, um, you know, after, after services or after a wedding or something would go downstairs. But they were living there. That was their living space now because they hadn't finished doing anything upstairs yet. So they'd been there for about a year and a half. So he said, the interesting thing here is he said, when when I, uh, came, after we bought, first bought the house, I came back with my dog uh, to look it over. And he said, as I walked in, there were these green globs, globules floating around in the air. And my, he said, the back of my dog's neck hairs went up and his, my dog started growling low. And I was going, what's going on? What's going on? And that, the dog was shaking and he took the dog outside. They slammed the door and he thought, that's strange. And he opened the door and looked in again and the green globs came to the door and he closed the door again. Um, he said, um, what I did was I called up a friend of mine who was a minister and the minister said, call this man. He's um, a local priest and he does, um, what is it called? You know, when you, you get rid of 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 the devils. Is it, exorcism or something? Yes, yes, exorcism. And the guy came. the 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 priest came over with bell, book, and candle, and and uh, a thing of um, of uh, holy water. Went in, opened the door, said his prayers through the door, and the green globules went boo and disappeared. He said, "I swear to you that that happened." I said, "Wow." Bruce and I left, and as we're walking down the street, I turned to Bruce and I said, my town, my story. And he said, you don't write it in six weeks, I'm going to write it. And I wrote it. <laughs> you wrote it? I sold it. <laughs> I think I sold it to Bruce for a pub, for, a, for a, that he was editing a, a um, an anthology, or I might have put it in an anthology I was doing. But it was... <laughs> I had never heard a story like that before, except on the pages, you know, of some crazy person's book. So uh, anyway, so that that oh, was wow. the, my favorite. My favorite. Where did this idea come from? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so what's been the greatest lesson that you've learned thus far in your writing career? I think three things. Um, one is that if you just talk about it and you don't write it, it's not going to be published. Simple. Yeah. Um, another is that um, an editor does not want to make your book worse. It does not want to make your book bad. They're trying to make money on your book. So listen when they give you their ideas. You don't have to take them. You don't have to take them all the way. You can take part of them, but don't think that the editor is your adversary. The, edi the editor is your advisory committee, but not your adversary. Um, and the third thing is, don't expect everything that you write to make you a fortune. Most books don't. Sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes you get very lucky. Sometimes it has something to do with the quality of what you've written, other times it has to do with the zeitgeist. Um, so you can't you can't hit yourself around the head and shoulders because you didn't make a, m a million dollars on a book, or that the book didn't sell then or there. It's if you come to it as a business, your writing is your writing, but then if you want to sell it. You have to come to it as a business. Um, who is most likely to want this kind of thing? Um, is this something that uh, you can sell on as um, an audio book or a, a, um, a somebody can make a play out of it or can you make a play out of it? I mean, but you have to think of it in terms of we're going to do the best, very best we can, all of us, to make this the best book it can be, all of us, uh, so that it can sell as well as it can sell in this day and age. I mean, who knows? 
I mean, something in the middle of your book being published happens and the world turns upside down. And so this book that you made that took place in say, say, um, uh, I don't know, some part of the world that is now exploding, um, doesn't do well or does do well because of that incident. Um, what if you had what if you'd written a book that that takes place in the Ukraine, which I have done because it was about my family, but I did it thirty years ago, so it didn't do all that well. Should I try to have it you know come out again? Maybe this is the time for it to come out again, or maybe it's not. There are so many little things that can make a book popular. Um, but if you're trying to make it sound just exactly like someone else's book, by the time you get your books out, that book has already taken up all the air. Here's a little story for you. Eight years before Harry Potter came out, I had a book that came out called Wizard's Hall. The main character was a little boy named Henry. His mother sends him to Wizard's Hall, even though he doesn't believe he has any magic. When he gets to Wizard's Hall, uh, there's a wicked wizard who used to be teaching at the school, who's trying to, to destroy the school and the students in it. Um, the pictures on the wall move and change. Um, uh, Harry's, uh, uh, Henry's best friend is is a redheaded boy, and his other best friend is the smartest kid in the school who is a girl. All right. Does that phone sound familiar to you? Uh, just now, a little. Eight, eight years earlier than Harry Potter. Wow. So did it do well? It did okay. Did it make a million, 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 zillion dollars? Could I have sat in... in uh, um uh the ballpark uh uh the the yankee stadium and filled it with my fans no <laughs> am, am i angry no these things happen you know if if she wants to send me a big check i would cash it but she's not going to do that you know and why should she we both probably found the same elements in the same kinds of stories that we read as kids yeah, interesting. So are there any groups, clubs, or organizations that you'd recommend um, to other writers that have helped you in your career? Well, SCBWI, certainly the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, I was the second person to join. <laughs> <laughs> and I was on the board for 45 years. Um, then um, uh, SFW, uh, no, Science Fiction Writers of America, SFWA, which I was uh, president for two years. I was the second woman to be president. Um, and um, both of them give you entree into what might be called trade secrets, but really are not secret at all. You just have to look for them, you know. It, but, but what you do find there um, are people just like you who are interested in the same things, who have done different, maybe different kind of homework than you did in finding out where to send things, what to do, uh, how to find an agent, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you will also, there will be people there who can be your, if not your mentors, certainly your shining light. Um, I can't tell you how I felt when I actually met Ursula Le Guin. I mean, I just was, almost dumbstruck. Um, we had been corresponding a little bit, but this was this was amazing to me. And I think if that's the sort of thing that can lift you up and move you forward and maybe take you to a different place in your own writing. That's true. Okay, I have questions now about you as a person. What is one <laughs> thing... <laughs> what is one thing that most people don't realize about you? 
I'm pretty open about most everything of who I am, but um, I'm fairly newly married after um, oh, 17 years as a widow. So I'm married to a boy that I had, uh, who's not a boy anymore, he's 85, um, who I had dated in college. And um, so we lived back and forth between Mystic and and, and Massachusetts. Um, let's see. My father was international kite flying champion. An international yeah. what champion? Kite. Kites. Kites. Champion. Um, that's a long and interesting story, but it's not for here or oh, right. Wow. That's great. Um, my well, that's mother, good. My mother came from, from um, <clears throat> eight children. No, wow. she came from six children all of whom went to college and all of whom, except for one, were top scholars. And the one who wasn't was because he changed his major in his last year into medicine. Um, my father came from 10 children, none of whom went to college, except for my father who went one year in college uh, and then became a journalist. Wow. So what <laughs> else can I tell you about him? I have, I have three children, six grandchildren, all three children have been published, Adam and Heidi especially well published. Um, two of the six grandchildren have published books. Um, um, my father's house in the Ukraine about, I don't know, six or seven months ago was bombed and it's no longer there. I've never got to see it. Some of my cousins did, and they took, they had photographs, or they have photographs. Um, what else do you not know about me? That's 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 fine. That's good. <laughs> okay. What is or are your passions uh, when you're not writing, and how do you make time to do the things that you love? Um, I enjoy. I'm a news hound. I I am always looking at MS, MSNBC. Um, I'm a reader, passionate reader, um, but I do a lot of reading of the news in the morning as well. Um, I, I enjoy going to critique groups of new writers and sitting there and helping them. I really feel like I have been sort of blessed in my career and I think under the circumstances, you give back or you pay back. Um, I I used to love going to conferences and and, uh, and but I, I'm, I'm I think that the whole COVID thing and my age has broken me of that. I don't I don't I've the only one I've been to recently two that I've been to recently was one SCBWI conference in New York and uh, the Boston Boston Science Fiction Convention, Boston, where you and I <laughs> bonded. Right. So so I don't know if that part of me is gone forever. Um, I, I just find it hard to be in groups of people. Some of that has to do with my age because I have to wear hearing aid now uh, because my ears have gone and it just makes it hard to be in noisy rooms, uh, especially if, even if I have the hearing aids in, this one doesn't work at all because that ear doesn't work at all. So I have to be like this to people. Mm. Um, right. So so I think that age is slowing me down on some of those things. I used to do a lot of teaching, especially with my daughter, Heidi, and she's still doing a lot of it and I'm doing less and less and less. Uh, so I can feel myself slowing down because there's still all those books I want to write before I go. Okay. So um, what what does your writing space normally look like? And what do you have to have with you when you're writing? Um, do you have to have certain well, uh, drinks? This is, this is my writing room in Mystic. 
Okay. It's a bedroom, a guest bedroom. So if a guest comes, I have to put all my stuff upstairs, which is not anywhere near as comfortable. Um, but this, this room is pretty spare because we go back and forth between my house and, and Peter's house. And, you know, when you get to be our age and you have your own house for so many years, I've been in my house 50 years, Peter, almost as long in his house. Um, and our houses are filled with our first marriages. Um, but also my daughter Heidi lives next door to me at my house. So, and we write a lot of stuff together. So um, I would say that that each of the houses has a different a, a different sense to it. Peter's house is much more um, well contained, and mine is just messy everywhere. Um, mostly books, books and papers everywhere. Okay, so do you have um, uh, certain drinks or um, snacks that you have to have with you? Um, sparkling water mm -hmm. and dark chocolate. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I have to be careful of the dark chocolate because at my age, you know, you can spend a lot of time um, eating dark chocolate and sitting on the toilet. <laughs> so <laughs> I have to be careful. Um, uh, I don't... I don't drink um, anything with alcohol in it. Never have been able to. Yeah. It's a sort of thing where I could, I would dance for two seconds on top of a table top after I drank some alcohol and then I would fall asleep immediately. So, <laughs> so when you're, when you're writing, do you prefer uh, silence or music? And if music, what type? I can't do music. The reason is that, the way I write is very lyrical and the music would push me. And I used to be a singer, so I don't have any voice left, but in high school and college, I was a singer and after college some too. Um, so, um, but I'm still very musical in my head. And what would happen if I had music playing is that the, that the, the lyrical um, ness of what was being played, whether it was um, uh, uh, with with without words, it would still push me into a different a different lyric than what I was trying to write at the time. So no, I don't, I don't, and I I can't write with people talking talking in the same room with me. I really have to be alone in the room. Um, I have friends who go and write in coffee houses because they have constant coffee or tea or whatever being brought to them and they don't he actually hear the people around them. Um, that would drive me crazy because mm. I'd, be, I'd be busy looking. Oh, and what does that person look like? And can I put that person, person in the... No, I can't do that. Okay. And writers um, often have furry or feathered or otherwise non-human companions to uh, help them through their work. And um, do you have any and do they help or hinder you? We have a herd of deer that uh, seems to uh, like to uh -huh. yard at Peter's house. And at my house, uh, we have usually a bear with several cubs, deer, um, uh, we have um, bobcats, a bobcat family. We have coyotes. We have a couple of otters in the Little River that uh, uh, is uh, one part of the um, end of the property. Um, uh, opossums. I think opossums are the most impossibly silly animal. I mean, what made any creator think that a, an animal that fell over and played dead with one eye open at you watching you? Know, <laughs> yeah, uh, adorable. Is, is, you know, uh, and, and, oh, and the opossum also gives out a smell as if it's dead. So every predator in the world would want to just come and start chewing on you, right? It's a stupid <laughs> <laughs> a stupid way of trying to stay safe. Um, so, but we have opossums, raccoons, um, weasels, rabbits, 
Oh, wow. You know, so it's it's a little bit like animal farm there. Yeah. I mean, we don't we don't have to feed any of them. Okay. I have two more questions, quick questions for you. Okay. Okay. Um, where can people find your work aside from Annie's book stop of Worcester? Um, and I have to give a plug to Annie's. You can get Jane's books at Annie's if you call us at 508-796-5613, or you can email us at orders at anniesbooksworcester.com. So where else can people find well, your books? Start there. Start at Annie's. Thank you. <laughs> if you want something that's already autographed or that can be specialized, uh, you could try the Eric Carl Museum, which is close enough for me to get to. Um, that's in um, Amherst, Massachusetts, or the, um, I think it's called High Five um, in Northamp the Northampton area, uh, or um, um, those, those are the ones that are closest to where I can get to. Uh, and, and there are a couple more stores around that, that are almost as close, like the Odyssey Bookstore in South Hadley. And they carry a lot of my books, all of those, those places. And if you contact them and ask them to be, the books to be signed to a specific person, I can get there within a week usually and uh, <coughs> and um, sign the books and then they will send them out. Great. Okay, so how can we follow your work and share your awesomeness? I am on um, online uh, as Jane Yolen at um, AOL.com. You can uh, find me at... Uh, what is it called? Um, uh, Facebook. Or... Facebook. Facebook. I'm not on on a lot of stuff. I'm on Facebook. Um, you have a website. I have my website. With Adam is my webmaster. Uh, <laughs> it's a really a wonderful website. It's just Jane Yolen. You just at uh, I don't know aol.com. No, at Jane Yolen at just. Go to wherever websites are. I don't know. Adam will know. <laughs> Jane um, Yolen, yeah. Um, but but um, once a week, I answer questions that that have come to me, specific questions like the kinds of questions you were asking, and it's put up in, on a part of the site that's called um, um, Q and J questions for Jane. Q and J, and um, we only put them up once every week, but then they stay up there, so you can see them. And I guess that's that's the best places to find me. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Jane. This has been really wonderful. Great. Yep. Well, thanks again, and uh, we'll be talking soon. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye.